Hi everyone! Welcome to week 12! The readings and content this week are a bit of a doozy. Uh, so there's a podcast on doxing, a New York Times Magazine article on swatting, and a chapter from an academic ethnography of trolling. Uh, the book that the chapter is from is written by Dr. Whitney Phillips and is called This is Why We Can't Have Nice Things, Mapping the Relationship Between Online Trolling and Mainstream Culture, uh, which might be the best title of an academic book ever, uh, in my personal opinion. So I think this stuff on doxing and swatting are easy enough to digest on their own, if perhaps kind of emotionally taxing to get through, particularly the swatting piece. For me, <laughs> at least. Uh, but the book chapter needs quite a bit of introduction and debriefing, and I really debated over which chapter of this book to give you guys that I thought would be the most helpful and the most beneficial and the most uh, sort of related to the stuff that's happening in this class. And I'm still not even entirely sure it gave you the right chapter, um, but we're going to run with the one that I chose um, because I do think that even if there's potentially a better chapter that we could have worked with, this one is a very good um, one to work with for this unit. As with many of the academic texts in this class, uh, undergraduate students are not <laughs> this author's primary audience. Uh, but I wanted to assign a chapter from the study for a number of reasons. And so, like, why are we even talking about trolls anyway? One, trolls are a phenomenon that has have arisen, has arisen, whatever, uh, in the past few decades, in part because of particular technological affordances of certain digital writing spaces like 4chan, Facebook, and Reddit. And the author does a nice job of describing how those technological affordances, coupled with certain cultural logics and socio-political climates, gave rise to trolling behaviors. Again, the difficult part was choosing which chapter to assign because the whole book is just so good. And if this is something that interests you, I highly recommend uh, checking out the, the book in full and reading it, you know, in all that spare time I'm sure you guys have as students. Um, it, it, it is a deep, thorough, methodologically sound investigation into this digital writing behavior. Um, so I do recommend it. It's on Kindle. I think it's also maybe in paperback it's not through Amazon. I don't know, because I read it on Kindle. In the end, uh, I decided to assign chapter seven from the book, which is called Dicks Everywhere, The Cultural Logics of Trolling. Now, as the title indicates, some of the content in this chapter can get a bit explicit, and that's because the author's subject matter, trolls, uh, are themselves often explicit in their humor and behavior. If this might be an issue for you, shoot me an email and we'll discuss. Um, I should also note that there are brief and sometimes casual references to rape and suicide, but in this chapter those references are brief and not detailed. Again, if that will be an issue, email me and we'll chat. Before going any further, we need to talk, though, about cultural logics. What does the term cultural logics even mean? This might be something you've discussed in other classes, but if not, here's a brief, really rough definition so that it kind of makes sense uh, going into the chapter. Now, the theories of cultural logic is really, really complex, and uh, my definition is going to condense all of that into like a couple sentences, uh, but here we go. So it... The idea of cultural logic is kind of a way of describing how within cultures there are a lot of shared beliefs and assumptions about the world that people maybe don't even recognize that they have because they're just so ingrained in the way that we do things and the way that we think about things. Um, you know, they're, they're not ubiquitous, um, but they are often quite common and shared widely among people in a culture. Uh, and importantly, they're often taken for granted. So I'll give an example. On page 127, in my Kindle version at least, uh, the author says, Trolling is animated by the same cultural logic that normalizes the drive for discovery and progress. To go further, to go faster, to go where no one, well, no one deemed important enough to count, has gone before. This, at least, is said to be the defining feature of Western culture. And she goes on to describe how this cultural logic is present in trolling, trolling behaviors. Now, that, that idea of the drive for discovering progress is something that, you know, if we don't give it a whole lot of thought, it's like, oh yeah, sure, we want to discover new things. We want to drive progress and, and move in you know, our society in particular ways. But the flip side of that, uh, you know, at least 
what her her quote you know the the parenthetical that she includes well no one deemed important to count uh is sort of alluding to the fact that sometimes on the drive for progress and change certain groups get kind of run over in the process um so that's a cultural logic that sort of assumption that discovering progress is good sort of no matter what um and the sort of counter to that would be kind of you know thinking through that a bit more deeply uh, somebody else that might have some ideas about that particular uh, cultural logic is uh, Dr. Ian Malcolm from Jurassic Park when he says, your scientists are so preoccupied that they could that they didn't even stop to think if they should. It's kind of a humorous example, but you get the idea. So another thing to mention up front is what precisely Phillips means by trolls. Uh, so Phillips points out in chapter 9, which I'm not having you read, um, that aggressive online behaviors and sometimes behaviors in real life um, have been sort of loosely categorized as trolling and, quote, includes everything from harassing celebrities on Twitter, harassing people you know in real life, to feminist political activism, to child exploitation, to being a, quote, total fucking dick, unquote, political pundit, close her quote. Uh, but Phillips works hard in the beginning of her text to define what she means by trolls. She's not studying aggressive behavior online more generally, she's studying what she calls subcultural trolling, which she describes as, quote, self-identifying trolls engaged in highly stylized lulls-based trolling, close quote. And yes, she literally writes lulls repeatedly throughout the book, which is kind of funny and one of the reasons that uh, gave made this uh, book both a, a pleasure and sometimes uh, really difficult to read. Uh, anyway, so what does she mean by lulls? Uh, lulls is loosely described as amusement as, at other people's distress. So essentially, the people she looked at in the study were those who, those, uh, who self-identified as pranksters looking to get a rise out of people, specifically an emotional rise, and to sort of stay emotionally distanced themselves, except, you know, to laugh at other people getting mad. Um, now, that paraphrase doesn't really do justice to some of the real-world damage that trolls can do and have done. But my point here is that these are the people that she's looking at, not just random jerks on the internet or your mom's cousin's next door neighbor that you got into a heated argument on Facebook with. And that brings me to one of the main points of the chapter and, you know, the whole book. Basically, Phillips argues that though mainstream media and people in general are often quick to condemn trolls, and while yes, much trolling behavior is callous, even abhorrent, Trolling behaviors of the type that she has studied have been made possible by and are a sort of reflection back on mainstream culture itself. At the end of the chapter, she writes, quote, As this chapter, and in fact, the entire second section of this book illustrates, trolls are hardly anomalous. They fit comfortably within the contemporary American media landscape, and they effortlessly replicate the most pervasive, and in many cases, outright venerated, tropes in the Western tradition. In that sense, trolls are model ideological subjects. The question is then, what exactly are people criticizing when they criticize trolls? I would suggest that criticisms of trolling behaviors are indirect, if inadvertent, criticisms of the culture that spawns them, immediately widening the scope and significance of the so-called so -called troll problem. In the chapter, she demonstrates how trolling behaviors reflect back the tendency of corporate media to engage in the same kind of fetish, fetishization, well, that word's a mouthful, to engage in the same kind of fetishization of disaster news coverage that trolls do. The only difference being that corporate media makes money off of it and trolls don't, and she associates trolls sort of rational logic of above everything else ethic with Western intellectual heroes like Socrates, Aristotle, and Schopenhauer. Aristotle, who we also cover in this class, by the way. It can be a lot to take in, especially if your previous knowledge of trolls is somewhat vague and fuzzy and mostly horribly negative. Uh, and let me be clear here, there are some really horrible things described in certain chapters of the book, though I think I've assigned you a pretty mild one. Uh, Phillips is in no way attempting to vindicate trolls, and neither am I. What I want to do with this reading and what Phillips is trying to get people to do is realize how these behaviors and attitudes and cultural logics are common in mainstream culture 
And to criticize and condemn trolls without kind of turning that critical lens back in on ourselves is maybe a little bit hypocritical. All right, so I'm going to stop talking and let you get to it. There are four discussion questions this week, so be sure to plan your time accordingly. The readings are also longish, but I really wanted you to get as complete a picture that we possibly can in a single week. But that's all for now. Have a great week.